Uh, so welcome to Bespin on the Open Web. Um, I'm Ben Galbraith. And uh, I'm Dion Almer, and we uh, most recently created uh, this thing, Bespin, that we'll talk about on the web technologies, but we also founded uh, Ajaxian.com, where we uh, gather the community to chat about all things Ajax. And today we work at a company called Mozilla. Um, you're familiar with Mozilla, of course. We work in the labs division of Mozilla. And in Mozilla Labs, we're working on a bunch of interesting things that we hope will help drive the web forward. So we've got these different kind of visualizations that people have done in of what the browser can do in the future and all of these kind of uh, crazy futuristic ways of accessing your history and kind of seeing where the different data is and playing around with uh, different cool things uh, that have been done, like Adaptive Path did a pretty uh, fun Aurora uh, visualization. So there's all this kind of fun futury lab stuff where people pontificate on uh, where we'll browse in the future. That's part of what we do at labs. But you know, really, when you move away from science fiction and you look at what the browsers are actually doing, you see the interesting trend that browsers aren't turning into minority report. They're actually getting simpler over time. Um, but what's fascinating at the same time is that the engine underlying these browsers is getting more and more interesting. And so that's what Dion and I do at Mozilla Labs is focus on how we can harness this increasingly powerful web runtime engine to do cool things for developers. And when the Ajax revolution kind of kicked off, these were the types of uh, sessions that, that people were talking about at events like this. So it was the very low-level uh, API, in this case, access in uh, XHR to be able to talk back to the server. But those days are kind of long behind us. We've already abstracted on top. And we've got these great libraries, more than just job, the GWT, which is fantastic. But there's a whole ecosystem of libraries that are out there, one for every star that's on this point every week someone comes up with their own Ajax library. And we kind of think that we've nailed kind of these DSLs for doing this little Ajaxy stuff, and it's time to move on. Yeah, Vic talked about in the keynote to start out Google I.O., the sort of future horizon of technologies, and we're super excited about that. It's clear that we're at the cutting edge, the cusp of seeing what's possible on the web be revolutionized. And so what we want to do with Bespin is explore how we can apply these technologies to developer tools, and in today's talk, we want to also talk about these technologies uh, with you, the, the, some of the, the newer open web technologies that we used, and why we're so excited about them, and why we think they're so disruptive. So, exactly right. We were playing around with a lot of these technologies, doing a lot of demos, and we kind of wanted to take these things and these cool things that uh, people have been talking about and seeing how far you can actually go. You know, we saw the great example with Wave. In our world, we're in developer tools. We have this, like, really nice advantage, which is, you guys, developers, I don't know how many of you are running IE, for example, uh, so we can go with these modern browsers, as I believe they put it, uh, <laughs> to kind of push and see what's going on, because in the drudgery that we sometimes have, where we have to kind of work with these, you know, my mom and dad that are running IE6, we don't get to play with the new engine, so we have the luxury to kind of play around. And in developer tools, what's something that people wouldn't think of as maybe being kind of running on the, on the web, and that was to build a... Uh, you know, top class code editor and experience. Something that was not only rivaling desktop class, that actually was better than what you could do on the desktop. And so we thought, you know, if we could build an editor that you could just use from anywhere, from a mobile phone to a web browser, um, you don't have to bring your code environment with you, it's just always there, that would be cool. Um, if it was really simple to use. Um, so a lot of the editors that we've seen out there require familiarity with the tool, a large learning curve, and they're really intimidating. And we wanted something that you could just jump right into. Um, and we wanted it to be incredibly fast and responsive. We wanted to make sure that you never felt like, geez, you know, it's not keeping up with me. There's a performance problem. If this is going to be successful, it's got to be lightning fast. I think collaboration is a key piece to this. And again, we're, we're really excited to see uh, Wave. I've worked at Google in the past, so I've had the luxury of knowing a little bit about it. And we want this rock-solid collaboration. As programmers, we're kind of used to, uh, other than some of the thought workers over here that pair with each other every, every uh, time they write some code, of kind of sitting in the cave, kind of writing this code. And we want to explore what it will be like with a more social environment. So we want this rock-solid uh, collaboration built in to your code editing uh, experience. I'm also a command line junkie, whether it's Quicksilver to, to do fun things on the Mac or just the Unix command line. We wanted to kind of put that into the code editing experience too and make it very, very social. So there's a, another labs project called Ubiquity. Ubiquity is all about kind of having this command line for the web with these social commands. So I can go out 
and uh, write an interesting command that now ties into the Wave APIs. And Ben can say, I want to subscribe to Dion's command. And as I do new version, he gets it in his command line. So we want to explore how we can build a really discoverable command line that people can kind of evolve on and share together. And then finally, this is uh, really important. I used to be a, an old Emacs guy and was one of those uh, somewhat sad people in university that like read my email through Emacs and that was kind of everything. And uh, I love the fact that it was totally self-hosted. And with all these web developers that are here, like how can you go and extend your uh, editor, your IDE? Uh, it, it can be pretty hard. Some of them have different kind of plug-in APIs that you can play with, but we wanted it to be fully self-hosted in just the web technology, just JavaScript, CSS, HTML, and so we want to make it so anyone can extend it, because you're in this tool, you know, eight plus hours a day sometimes. Let's make sure that it can be the tool that you really want. So that's really what we wanted to do. So let's give you a quick demo of uh, what we have. It's a work in progress. Let's turn on mirroring. So let's go into a file. So this is the Bestman editor. And um, one of the interesting things that we did is in order to get performance, we actually wound up coding the code editor from scratch using Canvas, um, one of these HTML5 technologies we've been talking about. And so, um, uh, can't start with the function, foo function. So, um, one of the things that I hope I'm showing is that it actually is able to keep up with us really well as we type, which was really important to us because we hadn't really seen HTML code editors perform that well. Um, and we have seen a few that perform well on, size, on files of reasonable size. This is um, you know, 1,500 lines of code. So what happens if we sort of step it up a notch and go to uh, 50,000 lines of code? We consider this a best practice for your projects. To it's just all have one, code one file. large file. And so we want to optimize for that use case. Yeah, we just find that uh, because directory addressing is so slow, we have a lot of files in a directory, it's so all one file on the Bestman team. But even with a really large obscene file, we're able to have performance, still keep up with us with live syntax highlighting and all that stuff. So we were really happy that we were able to achieve performance. And, and because we did all the rendering ourselves, we decided to just kind of be uh, um, obnoxious and do things like, um, you know, translucent scroll bars and things that you really can't do on the web platform unless you do it all on your own. So that's, um, oh, and we also have full undo, redo, and stuff like that, too. So that's the basic core editor. And then I should show quickly the command line? Yeah, please. So uh, uh, the command line, uh, show this is a little bit of an experiment. We have this pie menu thing, which, again, because we're doing all this in, in Canvas, we can animate and do fun things. Uh, again, I kind of mentioned, like, Quicksilver-like. And you can go through and run these uh, whole slew of commands uh, that you have access to, and you can look at your history and double click to run again, single click to put it in, and, and all these kind of uh, fun things. And um, what we should actually show you is just kind of what it's like to actually write a simple command, say. So there's a, a Bespin settings project that everyone gets when you get an account. And uh, I'll open up the calculate uh, command. It's just a JSON object that, that mimics the Ubiquity API, where you just give it a name and the arguments it takes and things like this. And you just get an execute function, and there's some other things like doing validation and the like. Um, but that's where you just kind of write your code. And then you can go through uh, and run it. Now, at first, I don't have this command. But what I can do is I can go into my settings, and I can turn it on. So I'll go in here into my config. And I've comment had commented out loading that particular command. So I'll uncomment that guy. I can run config to, to force the load. And now I can uh, calculate something on the fly. And then people can subscribe to these commands and like. So we found that people just going off and kind of writing their own uh, little commands is a very easy way for developers to just extend what they're doing, especially since you don't have to think too much about the UI and the like. But we also have APIs where from the commands, you can then come up and access the APIs uh, and do different, different things like that. Cool. We back to it? We'll yeah. show more about Bespin in a bit. Yeah, let's get back to the slides and talk a little bit more about this, because that's really what you want to see, is more slides. <laughs> um, let me turn off mirroring, just because we need to see a little bit in advance what's happening. So we're going to talk about the different technologies that we've used in Bespin. Uh, and then kind of look at some of the gotchas uh, 
in what we kind of experienced as we used them and, and things that we had to do to kind of uh, make this work a little bit too. So uh, you saw the full slide, so I'll just put it up there. Um, so we talked about Canvas, um, and we'd actually like to talk a little bit more about Canvas and how we've used it. And then we'll also be talking about some of the other technologies um, that play an important role here in what we've done. So Canvas, um, just want to blow through these really quick and just point out that traditionally we've been limited to three primitives on the web, text, rectangles, and images. And Canvas blows that out so we can do arbitrary rendering of all kinds. And um, you can actually do some things that um, are not immediately obvious once you mash up video in here too, like take video, pull frames out of the video and use Canvas to composite the frames on the fly and do things like um, you know, detect the light sources and put um, elements inside there all using JavaScript, Canvas, video, all that stuff. So Canvas lets us do things that are pretty amazing that have never been possible. But you might be thinking, well, we have Flash and Silverlight and other plugins that do it. We just want to review the specific reasons why we think Canvas is so revolutionary, even though with plugins we've been able to do some arbitrary rendering before. One of which is there's absolutely no startup delay, which is huge, especially with some of the plugins out there that block the browser uh, while they start up. And they're available on mobile devices today. There's no need to wait until mobile versions of these plugins are properly optimized. You can go use them on the... the um, on certain classes of mobile devices that are very popular, like the iPhone, that have full-featured browsers out there. Um, rendering fidelity with the browser, some plugins actually render their own fonts. And if you're into the micro details like we are, we think those things really, really matter when you have text that just looks different from the rest of the web page, from the rest of what the user expects. And having, uh, having Canvas actually there using the same pipeline as the rest of the browser makes a big, uh, big difference. And then the whole bridge system. So right now there's really interesting ways to bridge over to, to Flash and Silverlight and like, but you have to go through this marshalling experience, uh, which can be a little bit slow, even though uh, things are being worked on there. And you have to do that little bit of Swift stuff or whatever it is on the other side to bridge through to the system. Here we just kind of bypass that. And as we'll see when we look at some of the Canvas stuff, it's just JavaScript with a little API, and that's all you need to, to worry about and then kind of wrapping it all together. It's not this separate plugin with a separate lifecycle. It's native into the environment, into the browser platform itself. So um, the interesting thing about Canvas is that it actually came to us as a proprietary extension that Apple did. But the thing that we thought was interesting is just how far ahead of the game Apple was because Apple took the web and basically made it the desktop programming model for their widgeting system. And it seems like three or four years later, we're finally catching up with this idea that the web can actually be the desktop platform. And we'll talk more about that. And then the other modern browsers that are out there actually have this technology, too, as we've discussed. And there's the question of IE. What do you do with IE? Well, it turns out there are ways to get Canvas in IE. Google has created a VML bridge. VML is a proprietary uh, vector um, uh, graphics language that's been in IE forever. And uh, there's a JavaScript bridge that lets you use Canvas on top of VML really slowly. Um, and then there's a number of other bridges out there that are based on Flash and Silverlight. These are all works in progress. None of them are really great in quality right now. But if you look at Yahoo Pipes, for example, Yahoo Pipes has built a really great <coughs> application on top of the earlier VML Canvas bridge that I mentioned. Um, and then we have an experimental extension at Mozilla that takes our own Canvas implementation in Firefox and packages that up as an ActiveX plugin and lets you use it in the Internet Explorer. Uh, so there are a number of ways to get Canvas to IE. For us, we just said, hey, we're not actually going to support IE, and that worked out pretty well. <laughs> not that... Yeah. Not that we don't like IE. Yes, um, exactly, yes. Especially since, since Chris Wilson is here. We love IE. <laughs> we're passionate about it. Uh, hey, Chris. <laughs> SVG. Uh, a few people after we launched this that uh, really like SVG said, why did you use Canvas uh, and not SVG? It's got different advantages. Um, we... You know, we, we definitely think that SVG is doing some great stuff. We're seeing some great applications with it. But it, A, it wasn't really our background. Ben's a Java 2D kind of guru, so it, it fit what uh, his knowledge was already. And also, frankly, the Canvas API, as you'll see, is this very, very small, lightweight API that browsers can implement easily, whereas SVG is, um, you know, X thousand pages, and then there's the SVG Lite, and you get into kind of some of the same issues that we see with HTML, where we get the different browsers supporting it. But a lot of great things are happening. There's some uh, really great Googlers who are doing some really good stuff with SVG. So we're excited to see what kind of comes out of that, too. So we've all seen a lot of slides by now about Canvas, what you can do with it. Um, and we thought, if you were interested, we could actually start coding with Canvas to give you more of a feel of how it actually works. Um, and we thought, you know, it's one thing to create a code editor from scratch in Canvas. It's another to create a code editor from scratch using your code editor from scratch in a live demo using Canvas. 
Um, and if you guys would like to see that, we could spend a couple of minutes just writing the code editor from scratch in Canvas in front of you just to see what that's like. We obviously can't get a whole lot of features in there because there's a lot more we want to talk about. Would that be interesting? Yeah, should we do that? Okay, we'll do that for a few minutes. Um, let's see how far we get. <laughs> I reserve the right to bail. We've got to get syntax highlight in. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. Um, so let's <coughs> just go right into Bespin and see how far we get. So let's pull up the command line here. New file. Okay, so I've created a new HTML file. And uh, let's just do the boilerplate stuff. You'd think we'd do this. Live canvas editor. So let me just get this boilerplate out of the way. So what we're going to do is just do a simple HTML file. <laughs> <laughs> this is a new laptop, and I haven't quite adjusted to the keyboard yet. And the canvas tag, um, I'm just going to give it a fixed width and height, if you'll excuse me in this demo. Um, so normally what we do with the editor is we actually have a JavaScript uh, listener that listens to the, uh, the, um, the document size and, and sees when you resize the window and resizes the canvas automatically. And we'll just skip that, that part um, in this demo. And because I'm a little lazy, I'm just going to give this an ID. And I'm doing awful with typing today. Um, so we've got our basic HTML scene. And let's go ahead and save this guy um, very quickly and then pop open a preview. OK, so there's our blank web page. And let's elaborate a little bit. So the first thing we want to do is create some scripts. That <laughs> is going to uh, interact here with our little Canvas guy. So um, let's just do like a setup function. Let's do a setup function that we're going to call when the page is loaded. Anyone offended by that? Very good. And uh, we're going to get um, a reference to this canvas. So let's say canvas document get element by ID canvas. All right, so now we've got our canvas element. In order to do any drawing, you've got to get something called the context. And as you see here, it's the 2D context because it's imagined that at some point there'll be other context that lets you do 3D and uh, other than, other than 3D and 2D, I can't really think of what else there'd be, but it's flexible. Um, so we've got our 2D canvas. There is no 3D con uh, context uh, yet, but there are some proposals out there from various browser vendors. And um, once we have this stuff, you know what? I think I'm just going to do some global state here for this stuff. So we believe in large files and global state in your applications. <laughs> we'll be giving a JavaScript <laughs> tips talk after this one. <laughs> And uh, let's see, uh, the next thing I, I need to do is do a rendering loop. And uh, so what I'll just do is do set interval, and let's just do, uh, let's just call it paint. And let's kick it off every, uh, let's try 100 milliseconds. Well, that's, that's a good start. All right, so now we've got a paint function that's going to be called every 100 milliseconds. And uh, we've got a global context that the paint function can reference. And um, let's just start rendering. Uh, the editor. So what we're going to do is um, give ourselves some text to render. Oh, geez. <laughs> what just happened? Expose for the win. Um, hello, world. OK, so those will be our lines of text in the editor. And I'm also going to give us um, a cursor position. And let's put this at a new line. And um, let's have a function here that will render those lines in a canvas-based editor. So the first thing I want to do every time we go through this loop is clear whatever happens to be there. So the context has this function called clear rect. Um, and I'm just going to assume that we're always going to be 500 by 500. Sorry. Um, and once we do that, then I'm going to paint in a background color. Let's just go ahead and set our background to um, black. So, um, Canvas has the notion of a fill style, which when you do filling operations um, is obviously what it uses to style it. The fill style, there's also a stroke style. Um, these are just parsed um, CSS values. So I'm just going to set this to um, whatever I have for background there. And let's just do a black background just so we have something to see. And then I'm going to do fill rect. And then um, that'll give us a basic black background. In fact, if I save this guy, we should at least see that. And we'll see uh, absolutely nothing. 
Does anyone see the bug? So set up, set up, paint, paint, fill style, background, background, fill, correct. So this is the other part of the demo that we were really excited to show you. Um, and that's how you debug um, a Canvas-based application when things just happen to go wrong. Um, and uh, I see no errors in the application. It is not, it is not, it is not. Paint, fill wrecked, 500. Uh, fill stall. Oh yeah, yeah, why, why did row get colored there? Anyway, that's our, that's our problem. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. No errors. Canvas. So can anyone see the bug? This is. <laughs> so we believe in large files, global variables, and alerts. Glad we not log. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so let's give that a try. Do -do 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 -do. We can't say it wasn't live. Okay, so our paint loop is getting called. This is fantastic news. Um, feel wrecked. Feel wrecked, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, right. Zero, zero. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very kind. Moy um, Mablik. So let's try that out. Thank you from the kind gentleman in the back. Thank you so much. So uh, obviously, feel wrecked takes an X and a Y and a width and a height, obviously. Um, uh, clear wrecked, obviously, takes an X and a Y and a width and a height. Thank you, thank you. It's all part of the show, it's all part of the show. <laughs> so now, um, what we're gonna do is go through and iterate through each um, line in our little array here. And here's where we hit our first fun little roadblock um, with um, Canvas. It turns out Canvas has one text um, metric API and that's to determine the width of a string. Um, so you can't actually figure out what the height of a string is and if you've if you've worked with these APIs, you know that the height of a string is actually somewhat interesting. You can get like the actual bounds of a string or the ascent of the font, none of that stuff. So um, we're gonna do something kind of fun. We're just gonna say it's 15. Um, <laughs> and let's actually do a style for the text too. Um, let's just set the font to point Arial here and um, We'll deal with that in just and a I minute. think in Bespin, we take the width of the letter M and we assume that to be the height, right? Yeah, yeah, so we cheat. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We, uh, we render a one character string and then we, <laughs> we flip it and then we just assume that that's, yeah, anyway. So we have ways of tricking it to get something that is proportional that, that does the job. Um, and then we're just gonna set the font one to, uh, to our font here. And then uh, we're just gonna have a simple counter variable here and we're gonna set that to line heights and uh, then we're gonna go through and render each line. Now to do that, um, we also need to have a foreground. We'll do that really quick. White on black, everyone's favorite color scheme. And fill style equals foreground. Perfect. Okay, and now we can uh, fill text is the API that we need uh, for filling text. And uh, is it XY first and then the text or the text and then XY? We'll find out live on the fly. <laughs> um, so let's do lines I and uh, let's say zero Y. That feels right, that feels good. And then we, we will plus equal the uh, line height. Okay, how many people think it's actually gonna work? <laughs> Huge confidence in the audience. Well, I didn't anticipate this kind of a failure. <laughs> really? There we go, oh, undefined. Yeah. Awesome. All right, so uh, looks like I got my uh, length. length wrong. Yeah. Oh, and we're gonna be continually doing this forever and ever. <laughs> All right, so the next time, can I stop or do I have to, re okay, thank you, thank you. Let's stop that script. No, fill text is right, it's just my loop is, uh, is going madly out of control to the point where I think I may have to kill the, uh, it's all part of the fun of browsing 
in your <laughs> uh, <laughs> quite often yeah. <laughs> quite often we will see that I will have no lost work whatsoever <coughs> That's actually an interesting point. We, the, the very first prototype of Bestman, a core feature was that it's constantly saving your state, even though if you haven't done a save yet. So if you're going through, you're editing something, you get a phone call, you go home, you open up Bestman at home, and it will replay everything, including your undo, redo queue. So you can hit Control Z, Apple Z, and it is right back where it starts. There we are. Yes. <laughs> well, I is less than, thank you very much. Before you make, before you build a little too much, just come up on stage and do it. Um, so let's try this now. Um, great. So we've got rendered text. And the final thing that we wanted to show you is actually handling keyboard input. And uh, we'll just do, uh, should we just do document on keypress? Sure. sure. On keypress equals uh, handle keypress. Sure. Let's just call it that. And give us a handle keypress function. Okay, so now we have a neat little event that's been passed in, and so um, what we can do here is say uh, if lines.length is less than the position.row minus one, then we're just going to add uh, a new string to the lines array, and then we'll do lines position.row, um, and we'll just have it add in whatever we happen to have uh, passed in, so uh, car code. Then how do you get an actual character from the car code? From car code, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. So now with any luck, and I've had very little in this live coding demonstration, we'll have an actual <laughs> undefined. Very nice. So um, we'll probably take that as a pass for now. All right, so that's how you create a basic text editor from scratch using Canvas. Now, you notice how it's a little choppy? The solution there is, of course, to increase the resolution of your repaint. Um, and we found that uh, JavaScript is actually really, really fast. You can actually get really uh, tight with your repaint loops uh, yeah. and have CPU utilization still stay pretty low, and it becomes a lot smoother. So that's, that's sort of an example of how Canvas works and how you, you'd use Canvas to create an editor. And if that se seemed really tedious to you um, in the short demo, sort of imagine that with a lot more features, and that's kind of what it's like to code Bespin in Canvas. Um, but you know, it's actually, a lot of people, when we first did Bespin, sort of said, you know, that's crazy. Why did, why did, you, why did you do that? Why didn't you just use the built-in operating st system stuff? But it turns out that, that uh, if you look at Eclipse or IntelliJ IDEA or a lot of the other really popular IDEs, they've all actually written their text editing components from scratch. They actually haven't even used what's in the native operating system or in, or in the case of IDEA, uh, what's in Java. They actually just wrote it from scratch. And that's what most code editors do to give you the kind of experience that you want. Uh, when doing that stuff. So um, as we went through this process, we created something called Thunderhead as, as an experiment in trying to figure out what are the things that you'd want as you create components from scratch using Canvas um, to make life easier. And we'll just touch on this because it's, a, it's an experiment we're running. We're not really sure what we think of it right now. Uh, but basically, it's a toolkit that lets you do something like this. If you noticed in our live coding example, there's no um, component hierarchy in the canvas. There's just this canvas element and a bunch of Java 2D code. That's not very accessible, and it's also hard to understand what's really happening inside of it. So Thunderhead is a toolkit that lets you define a scene inside of canvas using tags and content, uh, and also styling it using CSS. So we wrote a CSS parser in JavaScript that um, will then let you apply the styles that you've done um, uh, to a canvas scene. So in this case, we also actually tackled layout, and we added layout constructs to CSS, um, too. Let me just show you um, how we actually use CSS to style um, a part of Bespin. And then we'll talk about layout in a second. So we showed this um, sort of dashboard file explorer. And if you notice here, we have these um, bars here on the left that have the gradient and another image that uh, says that there's files there, what we actually did was implemented CSS3's uh, image support and WebKit's gradient support. And we actually do this in JavaScript so that um, in JavaScript, we actually render the gradient and then uh, put that into Canvas. But we use CSS so that um, you didn't have to learn something new. So um, this is, that's what Thunderhead is. It's, this is experiment to say, OK, you can render custom components in Canvas that do things that are um, not easy or impossible with the DOM. 
but we want to make it easy and accessible, so we created this toolkit to do that. Um, Show the dashboard a bit more. Uh, oh, yeah, and so, thanks. Yeah. One of the things we did in the dashboard um, as an experiment was to do JavaScript-driven layout, and this is really experimental, just like, so here's a bunch of open files, and um, what can we do, like, as, as you constrain the space, what can we do to sort of adapt the layout and reduce the font size and display less and less information based on how much space you want to give it? Um, and so JavaScript layout is also part of Thunderhead. And then the other sort of miscellaneous thing that we added here is doing some intelligent stuff when it comes to, like, um, having long file names to be able to do truncation in the middle instead of at the ends, uh, stuff like this, just miscellaneous rendering that's not typically possible in HTML. Um, and when we, when we experimented with layout, we actually took a popular third-party layout manager in the Java world called uh, Form Layout, Jay Goody's Form Layout, which already had a DSL for doing layout, which um, I showed you but didn't really talk too much about on this slide, that lets you define a grid up front and then plug components into it. Um, and uh, we took that DSL and just ported it over to JavaScript just to have an experiment uh, to start playing around with how we can actually make layout easier. Um, and so that's, that's what Thunder is all about. So what about fast JavaScript? We've, we've seen that all of these engines are getting, you know, not just a little bit faster, but orders of magnitude faster. And so what's that actually going to mean uh, for our different applications? We should actually kind of see visualizations on, on what's going on here. Uh, first of which, do you want to talk about garbage collection? Yeah, that's right. So um, I think the key point here, if I can go back really quick, is that the JavaScript runtimes are getting faster. So the first key technology that, that really enabled Bespin is Canvas. And the second piece that's enabling us to do really cool things is the <laughs> fact that each browser is getting really fast JavaScript runtimes, at least most browsers. Um, and one of the new features that just landed in Chrome's V8 uh, JavaScript runtime is generational garbage collection. And we wanted to spend a second just explaining why we think this is really exciting to see on the web. Because typically, with garbage collection runtimes, which is what all the major browsers use now, um, you have objects that are put on a heap uh, that represent the data of your application. And when, when you filled up the heap, a garbage collection process goes through and cleans up all the objects that aren't being used, and then you can start to put more data in there. Um, but a key observation um, after seeing how these garbage collectors work is that it turns out most objects don't live a very long time. And so to have the garbage collector have to walk your entire memory space in order to reclaim these objects, most of which just existed for a transient period of time and are, and are now just totally bogus, um, can be sped up if you have a young generation where you have your objects created, and then the collector goes through and it turns out destroys most of that, and then an older generation where the fewer long-lived objects go to, which represents much larger space, and if you have this division, it turns out that you have fewer pauses in your application. Um, because as, as you try and do a lot in the browser, you'll notice that you start to get these pauses, that's GC. Um, and so Chrome getting this uh, just last week, at least in the public 2.0 release, um, is really, really exciting. And it's one of the really cool innovations we're seeing in these JavaScript runtimes that let us do amazing things in the browser. And we're playing around with different tools that will give you kind of visualizations on uh, what's actually happening uh, with the memory. So as a developer, you can see what's happening with the GC. Um, don't need to say anything there. Okay. We'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, to, to see, though, why it matters to, to have these fast things, kind of a, a canonical example would be, what would it be like to have Photoshop in the web? Uh, and this is kind of a, one of the stabs at doing that. It's called Pixastic, and it uses Canvas to, to give you a photo editing experience. And if we kick this off in the different browsers, what we're going to go is take the color, and we're going to kind of grayscale it uh, on the fly. So an algorithm is running, and you'll see Chrome kicked off pretty quickly there. And we're going to start to see uh, the other guys come in and... <coughs> Uh, a couple of issues that they have, this is why this speed up is really important. It allows us to do these applications that we want to take to the web uh, and finally kind of uh, get us there. So one of the core things is having these runtimes able to give us uh, what we need as developers to actually write these apps uh, on the web, and we're starting to see that, and it's kind of a, a breakneck pace uh, of innovation. Did you see those dialogues that popped up in Firefox and Safari? Those were the long-running script dialogues that just say, hey, wait, you know, the script has just kept running. Do you want to keep going? We're going to talk about what to do with that right now because it's exciting to see that JavaScript's speeding up, but it turns out um, that I've jumped ahead for a second, and before we explain those dialogues and how you can get rid of them, we're going to talk about bottlenecks in code. Yeah, so there's various bottlenecks going on as you, as you do your application. There's probably one in uh, that Pixastic example uh, we want to talk about a bottleneck that we ran into with Bespin um, that was actually totally fake. So 
JavaScript, we thought would be a huge bottleneck. Everything we're doing with Canvas, all of the work that we're doing there is all our JavaScript logic of calculating what to do to actually draw that page. And so we had this assumption that JavaScript was going to be a huge bottleneck uh, for the best bin editor. So one of the features that we had there was syntax highlighting, and we used a nice open source package that's really meant for you go to a page, you paste in a bunch of HTML or JavaScript, and it gives you a pretty set of HTML that comes out. Well, we just kind of took that, and we started to use it. And as we were profiling Bespin, we were seeing that every time it was going through in Ben's code, he was painting those lines, going through that lines array, we were doing syntax highlighting every time, maybe every 25 milliseconds. And so suddenly, in that syntax highlighter, we saw that it was doing 500 regular expressions. So it's doing like 500 regex on every line every time it painted. And this was like a day before we were going to uh, push Bespin out there for, for people to play with, and it was scary. So we decided to rewrite a very simple state machine-based uh, syntax highlighter that would be kind of aware of, of our world where it's painting all the time. And we spent a bunch of time and got that all working just fine. And then we profiled it again, and there was no speed difference at all. On the micro level, we were like 500 times faster, 1,000 times faster, whatever. But JavaScript, it turned out, wasn't the bottleneck at all. It was all the blitting code of uh, getting all the stuff over to Canvas and all these other browsery things that were going on. So our huge lesson was working out what that bottleneck is and not having assumptions that we've had for a long time that, oh, it's probably JavaScript because JavaScript's slow. Uh, so we paid the price for that. So um, this is an example of interface latency, and it relates to those pop-up dialogues that I started to mention before. <coughs> the green indicates that I've clicked, and notice that I've clicked on the word hello, and nothing seems to be happening, and uh, eventually it'll come back. And this is a problem that plagues desktop applications, and will start to plague web applications. It occurs whenever you have computations occurring in the client. We wanna talk to you about why that is and how you can solve it uh, really quickly. The reason this happens is because, um, and this, all GUI architectures basically work in the same way. Um, let's talk in terms of the browser. What happens is the operating system will ship to you all kinds of I.O. events, input events, sorry, from the user. And they land in this queue, and then it's up to the browser to pull these events from this queue and do something with them, dispatch these events. And as a result of these input events, typing on the keyboard, moving the mouse, we'll either execute JavaScript code or the browser will actually go to a new browser page because you've clicked on the go button or something to go to another page. But the key point is there's one process, one thread that's doing that. And if you have a multi-process browser like Google Chrome or you have a single process browser like Safari or Firefox, it doesn't matter because we're talking about the scope of a single page in this case. That page can only do one thing at a time. And so that's why you have these interfaces that freeze up. And so the, the solution is to actually create a background thread that does anything, any computation that's likely to lock up that browser. But unfortunately on the web we don't have background threads. But when you think about it, um, XHR is um, this thing that's let us go and make a request to other servers is essentially a single purpose background thread that lets us go and do that and the browser manages that. Um, and we've been able to use things like Gears, um, and other plugins like Java and Flash to sort of give us something to do in the background. Um, and HTML5 gives us something called Web Workers, which also gives us this background thread concept. But it gives us this concept with a big difference. Threads are considered deprecated by some of the big thinkers in computer science because of something called shared state. Because threads have access to all of your variables just as your main thread has. And so what happens typically with most developers is we create threads, we do things in the background, we feel really great about our abilities, but inevitably these threads start to touch the state that the other threads see, and, and they do that in ways that we just can't predict. And even though on paper you'd look at the problem space and you think, hey, I got that, I can do that, I can, I can create a program that's gonna behave in ways I'd predict using threads, but in practice we've seen that threads inject all kinds of unpredictable bugs into applications. So workers take concurrency and do it a little differently, where they give you basically what you'd recognize as a thread, but a thread that has no access to your state, to the main thread state. All you can do is just pass messages to it and receive responses in return. That's the big innovation that has a lot of people feeling like workers may be the right way to do concurrency. And so we, we have a couple of demos to show you why this comes in so handy. The first demo we wanted to show you is, frankly, a demo that shows you how sensitive we are 
to interface latency. Um, it turns out that um, you can sense delays of a really short period of time. I've got code here that just goes off and sleeps, essentially, for the number of time that you see here. And so if I click on this button, you'll see that I register pretty much an instantaneous response. It seems like, to me, that the program responds right when I click on the button. But as I start to add the delay, it starts to, it starts to feel, what would you call, a little sluggish. 100 milliseconds isn't bad. You can still tell the difference between 50 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds. But as we step up, you start to see that even a tenth of a second difference makes me feel like the program isn't quite responding, isn't quite keeping up with me. And it gets really bad at, at 350 milliseconds. And what's the emotional response that you have when a program doesn't respond right away, when it's sluggish? How do you feel about that program? If you're like most people, you hate it. You really hate using it. You really hate using these programs. And we're talking about really small details, right? We're just talking about a tenth of a second, a fifteenth of a second, not a fifteenth of a second, uh, uh, like an eighth of a second. Um, but it really, really matters. And so this is the challenge as we start to create richer JavaScript applications. Sure, we can do a lot more on the client, but if you tie up that main browser thread for these small periods of time, in this case, even just 50 milliseconds, the difference between 50 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds, you've started to create an interface that isn't really responsive. And once you do that, people just start to feel like, hey, this is sluggish, this is not really an application I enjoy using. And so it's really important that none of your JavaScript code takes, has the, has the ability to, to execute for longer. I mean, pick your threshold, I would say, even like 50, 50 milliseconds. If it's gonna take longer than 50 milliseconds, you've gotta put it somewhere else other than the main browser thread. So where do you put it? Well, you put it in the background. Um, and why don't we actually just, should we just switch to that demo? Uh, yes, the main one. Yeah, uh, the, do you want to do the, how about we switch to this one? Yeah, perfect, yep. yep. So this is a demo done by the same guy that uh, did that cool fancy iPhone on the fly canvas thing. And what he's doing here, the Firefox is gonna rotate and that's his visual way of showing that uh, the application is responsive. But what's really happening is he's got JavaScript code that's gonna simulate this annealing, which is gonna calculate the shortest path between all of these points. And we're gonna kick it off here without workers, and you see immediately the browser froze, which we can tell from the, the Firefox icon, and it's gonna go through and do this uh, you know, CPU intensive thing in these tests, and suddenly it's gonna come back and do the calculation and the browser's back. For that entire time, the browser's frozen. We do it with workers, Firefox is happy, we can interact with the UI, and boom, then it comes in. So it makes a huge difference because he took that calculation and he ran it off in this web worker space. And so we've got fast JavaScript now, and we've got workers which allow us to run that fast JavaScript off of the main thread and give us what we really want, which is the UI responsiveness. One more quick demo. Um, some of you may be thinking, okay, you know, I really don't care about 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. I'm really, I really just don't think it matters that much. One of the other reasons why um, it's important to make use of workers is what happens, frankly, when um, you tie up the UI thread for a certain period of time. So this is an example, um, and it's a very simple example. Let's view the source. That um, when the page loads, I go into this run test function. And this run test function, can I bump up the font size? This run test function, uh, the first thing it does is it sets an interval, um, a timeout, a timer, that every second just logs something to the console. And then I go inside of a loop inside of this run test function, and this loop is gonna take a fairly long time. This tests something really important, and it's another aspect of workers I don't think we mentioned yet, and that is that the workers will not the, the workers will not interrupt JavaScript code to update the UI ever. Because what happens is you start a worker and then when the worker finishes it has a callback that is inside of your main JavaScript code that then has access to your main application state. And that callback will never preempt, interrupt an executing function that you have in JavaScript, you would think. But it turns out when you have really long running JavaScript code, like I'm about to show you, where'd my little console guy? Go. Let's have this guy go here. All right, so I've locked up the browser because I've got this tight loop. And then eventually, Safari shows me this slow script dialog that says, hey, listen, do you want to interrupt this? This is an exceedingly poor user experience to have this thing pop up, as you would imagine. But then the other interesting thing is, I haven't given this demo on a constrained display, where's my, where's my fancy expose, is that gonna work? 
let's just uh, have it continue, and then I'm going to have to go back over to this debugger to show you this piece. The sort of scary thing is that um, it interrupted, it broke this contract of interruption. So if you, if you go back and look at the source code, my code says that I have a loop that interrupts for, what is that, 100,000 or a million? 100,000 iterations. And then after the 100,000 iterations, my loop stops. And then, in theory, this timeout should occur. But if you look at the debugger, when Safari presented that dialog to the user, it stopped the execution of my top-level function and started allowing the timer to occur. And then when I hit continue, it stopped the timer and went back to my top-level function, finished that, and then went back to the timer. In other words, it breaks a fundamental assumption that you make about the safety of your application. So in other words, it's not only a poor user experience to do things on the main UI thread. You can actually, in some browsers, break your application. So you really just want to make sure that you use workers, I guess, is the sales pitch there. Uh, I doubt it. Um, I doubt it. I haven't tried Chrome. Um, Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So how do we use workers? Well, as you're in a code editor, you're doing things like syntax highlighting. We also are doing detailed uh, real-time analysis. So we've got JS lint, for example, in your JavaScript file that's running constantly and telling you if there are any syntax errors in real time. Uh, but if that calculation was running in this way on the main thread, then you'd be typing and there'd be all of those same pauses. So we take all of these different modules that are doing interesting analysis, and we run those in the workers. So that's always happening in this kind of side world, and then it, when it's got an answer, it can tell us what's going on in this, this real-time uh, syntax analysis in that example. Now, to get this working, uh, the browsers have still slightly different APIs uh, for, the, for the, the web worker API. So we have a worker facade which we're going to split off into its own very small little open source project, but you can look at it in the Bestman source code right now. Bestman is, of course, 100% open source. Um, and what it does is it sits on top of both the Web Worker API and on top of Gears. So if you're in a browser that doesn't support Web Workers yet, but you do have Gears, then it'll work. And finally, it'll do a, a set interval to try and just make it, you know, actually execute the code automatically for you. And it adds in functionality that the browsers don't have. So Safari, for example, doesn't have uh, an import scripts method uh, that you really need within workers because workers are running in their separate little process. They don't have access to the browser's document object or any of those things. By design, this is great for security and everything else. So part of the API is you can then import these other scripts. And we do that ourselves in Bespin where we say, here's a worker. And here's this nice Bespin call space that you can then go ahead and do uh, particular things. One of the things that we do here is if you look at the Bespin code, it's an event-based system with just publish, subscribe, and that is built into the workers. A big pain that we had was marshalling over these objects to the workers, having them do things, and getting it back into uh, our world. So what we did is we have a worker with a, its own little Bespin script that allows you to create a worker and say, I want to subscribe to the document changed event, and I'm going to do something. And when I'm done, I'm going to publish this other event, and we marshal it over this barrier uh, automatically. And so now we have this facade. It's very trivial for us to take a piece of code, see that it's taking more than 50 milliseconds, and make it run in a worker instead. And it just kind of goes through the different issues that we've had. Uh, for example, one thing that we found right away was we started to do all this real-time syntax analysis, and the CPU was going through the roof because we were firing off all of these workers. Um, you couldn't do that before. We were, we were stuck in this single thread. Now we can do all this stuff, but we're kind of taking over the user's machine. So we've got a little kind of slicing algorithm that's in there now because we unfortunately don't have yield and concepts like that in our world that you have to start thinking about so you're kind of doing a little bit of work and kind of checking in uh, to make sure that you're, you're not doing too much and firing off too many workers at once and things like that. So if you want to do worker stuff, um, we've gone through some of that pain, and you can just take a look at our worker facade to see what it's like to actually use these things. So we've been talking about Canvas, fast JavaScript, and web workers as technologies that, that really <laughs> enable us to do some amazing things in the browser. The last thing that has us really excited is removing the cliffs that we've experienced as developers. Um, for us, the cliffs that we have is this notion that you can develop in one environment but only get so far and have to jump to another environment. You sort of hit, hit this wall where you have to start over and learn a whole, whole new set of tools just because you want to do something subtly different. For example, on the iPhone, 
it, you can get to a certain distance creating a web application in mobile Safari, but if you want to integrate into some of the um, you know, device-specific APIs, you've got to stop using HTML, CSS, and all these other web technologies you know, and learn Objective-C and a whole new tool chain and so forth. Um, and, and we see that these cliffs over and over and over again that destroy productivity in the industry. And so we're really excited to see uh, the emergence of technologies that just say, hey, just take the web stack, the web platform, and use that wherever you happen to be, on the desktop, on mobile, or whatever. Fluid and uh, Mozilla Prism and Accelerator Titanium are three open source environments um, that, that do this. Adobe Air um, is a great commercial environment that also is experimenting here that's saying, hey, listen, how can we take a web application and run this in a desktop sandbox? And Gears has explored this. And then there's this um, application called PhoneGap that actually takes the native iPhone APIs and exposes them through, a JavaScript, um, uh, through JavaScript objects to web code that lets you take web applications and actually access APIs that, that are really formally only available to native uh, applications. And so these are, this is an emerging trend that we're really, really excited about. And we have um, a desktop version of Bestman in development using some of these technologies that we'll talk about later on in the year. Um, we're also really excited about um, the Palm Pre. Yep, so they've taken this to the next level. We saw uh, Michael talk about that yesterday at the keynote on just like, well, th everyone's programming in this web world. Um, how are we going to compete with Apple and the like? Let's make the platform just the web platform. And so everything that you're used to in the HTML5 land, and they've got some uh, extra APIs that they talked about, now as web developers, we can really start just using the same skills and the same APIs to build these apps. So this is very exciting for us at Mozilla to see the web kind of get past these cliffs and let you write to, to more APIs. So um, the other place we're seeing this too is with Jetpack and Chrome extensions, this idea of using the web as the extension platform instead of Zool or you know, other, other proprietary um, uh, sandboxes, uh, APIs. The web is, is winning. Um, so talk about Jetpack very quickly. In the background here, you will see Bespin going off and, and creating uh, a Jetpack. Uh, and you can see this video online. But what Jetpack is is a way to extend the browser uh, with very, very simple web APIs. And the Chrome guys uh, have been talking about their extensions, which is very, uh, very similar. You don't have to learn the proprietary world. It's just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it was really, really cool for us to be able to take Bespin and in the fly, in the browser, in Firefox, add uh, a little piece of functionality to the Chrome of the browser, like add in a little status bar that tells you your Gmail notifications, and in real time, just say, install it right now. A little pop-up says, you want to install this guy? You say yes, and you've just extended your browser. You don't have to restart it. You don't have to do anything. So especially for development now, it's getting very, very easy, uh, and hopefully a lot easier as these guys kind of progress, uh, both the Jetpack and the Chrome extensions, where the browser itself will just be this web environment for you to extend. And it really lowers the barrier. We've already got 8,000 extensions or add-ons on Firefox, and that's with things being you know, a lot harder to use than what web people are, are used to. So we're really jazzed about extending the browser in new directions, too. So we've kind of talked about um, the web platform and features of the web platform that we've used in Best, but we just wanted to spend a couple of minutes at the end of the talk talking about where we're going, uh, and then we'll have a few minutes left over for Q&A. Um, as we develop Bespin, we're really interested in how we can do something that doesn't look like this. Um, we really want to keep Bespin accessible and friendly uh, and capture a, a lot of people's attention who traditionally have eschewed IDEs. But at the same time, it's kind of a challenge because it's one thing to look at this and say, yeah, we don't want this big bloated um, interface. It's another to say, well, well, wait, actually all of these are somewhat useful, so how do you start picking them, uh, picking them out? And so. We're experimenting with interface techniques that will enable us to let you spend most of your time looking at all of your code and letting you access other features without having to have docking panels and things like that. We don't know if they're a good idea or not, frankly, but we're playing around in that direction. And then um, fits in with the, the wave thing that's going on and the playback APIs and things like that. We want to integrate with that world where we from the beginning, made Bestman this very social tool. So you can collaborate and things like that. But we want to go further than that. So what's going on here is you have a social bar kind of on the right side that has your different uh, coders in your project network, whatever. And there's this little chat thing. And it's not just like, OK, here's IM chat that's, uh, that's over on the side. It integrates with your coding experience. So it's associated with the file that you're working on. You can also maybe select a piece of the code and see what was said 
about that particular code. Who wrote that? What were people discussing? So we want to tie these things into the code in a better way than just having comments that, that people don't like to update. So we've got that, and then we have uh, the next piece, which is the, the timeline view, where you can just real-time see all of the commits that have happened, different tags for that particular version, and you can on the fly go back and just see what's happened. So the file will change uh, as you go back in time. So you can really kind of see what's going on in that particular piece of code and obviously make it very social with, with your various friends. This is Brendan Eich, the inventor of JavaScript. Uh, we have a feature going in with Bespin where you can follow people. So I could follow Brendan while he hacks on code. Luckily, he hacks on all open source stuff, so there's no uh, issues with doing stuff within a company or what have you. But wouldn't it be cool to see what it's like uh, being Brendan and see what it's like with him writing code? And we want to kind of open up this model so we can start following people and then even play back what they were doing. So you're in a, with a, teammate, a team member. You had to go to the doctors. You come back. It would be pretty cool to be able to see, well, what was the actual code that they uh, went ahead and did and go through, change the, the playback metaphor, and then real time just kind of see uh, exactly what they were typing at that time. So these are some of the things that tie in with Wave and social and real time that, that we're playing around with. We think that having an environment like this sort of can unlock open source in a way that we haven't seen before. We think open source is really just what we've seen is the tip of the iceberg, and that if we had an environment where people could go in and instead of having to download a dev tool and figure out where code is and figure out how to submit code back to the project, they just hit a web page, boom, you're in the code, you can immediately start editing code, click a button, submit a patch to a patch queue, and have people review it where you can actually follow the project leaders around and watch what they code, where you can actually say, okay, show me what they coded yesterday. When you come back to your desk and you've seen that the code base has changed because a bunch of patches have been committed and you can actually play those back and see them instead of parsing diff files, we think that will revolutionize open source and help take it to the next level. And so that's where we're headed with Bespin. Um, and, uh, and in general, we're really excited to see the web kind of go from the Ajax space, which was can we actually do cool applications with the web platform to what we're seeing emerge, which is we can create the world's best applications on this platform, not just, not just flight, but flight with style, I guess you'd say. Anyway, thanks very much for coming to the talk. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So we have like uh, a, a minute and a half for questions, I guess. Should we just like take a question? Yeah, okay, so if you, if you go to the microphone to ask a question, there's one right behind you. Um, yeah. So how did you guys implement uh, mouse detection and mouse events for... Using the DOM. So we have a top-level DOM listener that, that's registered on the entire uh, visible canvas area, and when you click on that area, then we translate in our JavaScript code what that means for us. So we figure out what line you were over. Um, so then you're using a worker, essentially, to do the calculation, or are you doing it on the main thread itself? So stuff like that we do on the main thread. So workers, you don't want to have your entire application in workers because the challenge of marshaling and demarshaling state would be enormous. You want to isolate the, that functionality that has the potential to be an interface bottleneck. 50 milliseconds, it turns out, is a really long time in terms of computation. And so, yeah, stuff like um, taking a raw x, y and figuring out what line that corresponds to, things like that, that's all done on the main thread. Okay. And only HTML, CSS, and JavaScript right now? Or any other languages that you're supporting for oh, syntax Oh, as far highlighting? as like syntax highlighting stuff, we actually have more than that right now. Yeah, so people have contributed yeah, Python, PHP, Ruby, uh, a, a whole slew, and it's very easy okay. to add them. The, the goal is we want to have uh, a syntax highlighter plugin system that understands Emacs style, VI style, TextMate bundle, yeah. so we don't have to reinvent yet another wheel. Cool. See you at Best. Thanks. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, <clears throat> I'm very interested in the collaborative aspects of the tool, and I was just wondering, what are your capabilities in terms of, uh, you know, sharing code and searching for code that other people have done and so on, uh, you know, uh, like functions and all that stuff? So, so right now our model for collaboration is really focused on helping you have a social network of people that you're interested in coding with. In a company, that would be your team. In the open source world, that would be the contributors to a project. And it can also be people that you just like to follow. 
and the ability to watch them code, the ability to code together on a file, the ability to do traditional VCS things like show me who's done what in the file, that's really all we focused on. If I've understood your question and like finding code that people have written that does X or, exactly. or stuff like that, we haven't thought too much about that. We'd love to have you come join us on the project and help us think through those issues. Um, yeah, so we, we're excited the fact that all of this code is in the cloud and so we can have intelligent agents watching the code. So, for example, we want, you're in a project and you say you want to target IE6 and I'm using the prototype library and things like that. And on the fly, as you write some code, it can say, hey, there's a known bug where if you do this, this, and this, and you're targeting these browsers, this is what happens. So we want to add yeah. stuff on the server that's just kind of constantly watching the code and would allow you to search across projects and do stuff like that. We're out of time, so we'd love to talk to you after. Thank you.